we will get going. So thanks everyone for coming back, for joining us this morning. Um, as as Jasper Nahakan mentioned, I'm going to talk about weekly, super, weekly supervision, uh, but for semantic segmentation, a different application domain. So we talk about classification, where you want to know if there is a cat in the image at all. We talk about detection, uh, where you want to know where is the cat and localizing it with a bonding box. And what we're going to be talking now is about knowing which pixels are cat. That would be semantic labeling. And um, which pixels belong to which cat would be intersegmentation. And of course, you can see that if you solve intersegmentation, that, that it's a harder problem, it's a superset of semantic labeling. So there's quite a bit of literature on weekly supervision for semantic labeling. And in 2018, most of the communities focused on intersegmentation, and thus the latest work uh, focused on that. So the goal of this presentation for this morning is to try to give you a big picture, try to understand which are the ingredients that do um, this literature or which people work on. And I'm going to try to dive in in three different papers, one from last year, one from this conference, and one in the archive, so in the future. And hopefully it will be, uh, one of them will be interesting for each of you. So um, I thought it's, it's uh, larger than, than, than I expected, so maybe it's not so intimate, but if you have burning questions, please do ask questions. If you, are, if you don't want to interrupt, please keep them, ask them at the end. Um, we came here just for this, just to talk to you. We made these slides, we spent some time working it, we rehearsed it. So really try to make the best of it, ask questions. All right, so fully supervision means that you are directly supervising the task. You're saying, this is my input, this is the desired output, this is how we train. Um, sorry, forgot one important question. Um, first, uh, who here is actually working on object detection and uh, pixel labeling? Just understand who's like working actively on this. Okay, great. Um, who's actually working on weekly supervision for this? Like already on the domain? Interesting. And last question, who has heard of a technique called GAP or CAM? Great. So, okay, two persons. So the two persons raise their hands, wait half an hour, and then it gets interesting. The other ones, I think you will get the most of this. All right, so weekly supervision then is this indirectly supervised, where you're not directly providing the desired output, you're providing something else that will lead to have the desired output. And as uh, Hakan explained, this is difficult for uh, multiple reasons. Um, for instance, we can see that um, uh, there's a lot of diversity in appearance, even, even for something as simple as a cat. Uh, no, the, the points, if you have a click supervision, right, the points that are provided, they all look different, and the shape of the overall cat looks different, so it's hard to infer what's going on overall if you have few samples. If you have infinite samples, then you have seen every single point of a cat, and then it's easier. But with finer samples, this might be an uh, ill-posed problem. Uh, it's also, um, when, uh, if you have point supervision, you want to guess the overall extent of the object, and sometimes um, just the gradient of the image doesn't give you a clue of you know, how big the object or how small the object is, and you still want to be able to solve those problems. Um, sometimes also even the semantics are ambiguous, like is this the label, is this the bottle, is the bottle with this weird path, should it be there or not? So ex estimating the extent of the object is difficult. Um, and the last one is that, uh, also like I mentioned, we have issues with co-occurrence, right? If the category here is sale, how many times do you see a sale with other boats, right? And hopefully you ever learn to distinguish these, these two. So it's a difficult problem. Um, when you have limited sample, it's very ambiguous, but we still want to tackle it. And at the end of the day, there's only, at least in my view, there's only two sources of information to solve this. You have priors, and you have some kind of hints you provide. So the priors are what you believe to be true, independent of any particular image. And this uh, hopefully is uh, as correct as possible, but might be a bit wrong, and still uh, you apply your priors there. And the hints are this indirect supervision you provide for each image that will help them to learn uh, the model you want. So just to give a high level picture, if you imagine kind of a space of all possible uh, functions that go from the image to the pixel labels. Think of this as like all the possible parameters a complex could take. Um, then when you have priors, you're saying there's a specific region that I believe to be valid, and I have a, a probability distribution of what I think to be the most likely to be modeled and the least likely to be modeled. And when you have uh, one sample with um, uh, these uh, hints, right, you're, you're kind of limiting which kind of uh, functions could ever map from this particular input to that particular output. And as you accumulate more and more sample, the space of possibilities gets reduced, but it never goes to zero, right? You always have this small region in there where it's ambiguous what could that be. Um, and that's where you want to have your prior that kind of disambiguates among the, the constraints of uh, the samples to have 
you know, the one answer that we believe would generalize the best. Uh, so that's the relation between uh, the priors and um, and the pins. So let's talk a bit about the prior uh, quickly. So I can actually uh, cover quite a bit of those um, that apply for uh, object detection, and many of them do apply also uh, for pixel labeling. So a big one is, for instance, uh, the size of the object. Right. So the size of your cats could be very big or very small, um, but it turns out that many data sets actually have some biases because people take a picture of an object, and then the size of the object that will appear is most limited that it could be if it was just a robot taking a random picture. And that's a prior you can leverage, and it has been regularly leveraged in different works. Uh, it allows to constrain the space. Similar is the shape. Uh, sometimes you know that actually the cats in my world are all round, and that helps to guess what could be the overall extent of the object. And that be used uh, as old as in graph code methods to assume the object is, is roughly convex or have some kind of star shape. And this helps for this task. Um, this also has center bias in most data sets, and this is heavily used. For instance, in object detection, when you initialize with one almost full covering box on the on the image, you're basically assuming that there is center bias, and that's quite helpful if you make it there. Um, Another way where the location can be biased is uh, you're assuming it's on the ground, right? If you have a street scene, typically, you can have a good estimate of the horizon, and then your object, instead of being anywhere, they must be in this region, they must be, have a relation between location and scale. The number of instances, many methods actually assume that you will have one object, and in many data sets, this is true. So this is something you have to be careful. If you look at, uh, you know, like 2010 papers, most of them get away with only one object, uh, uh, per image, and then we actually updated the data sets to be more challenging, and then many methods break down because this prior doesn't apply anymore. And then the, one of the core ones that basically every which we do supervise semantic segmentation paper use is this notion of contrast, uh, which means that you can tell apart somehow the overall shape of the object of interest from its backgrounds, um, illustrated here. And it comes in two flavors. One of them is the notion of boundaries. You can have a somewhat reliable estimate of boundaries. And in 2018, actually, we have really good methods uh, with uh, somewhat class agnostic boundaries um, that are trained with uh, convolutional networks. And this is also the basis for some of the objectness measures that I can uh, mention before. And the other one is the notion of saliency, which is not quite the same in the sense that in saliency, you really try to solve the task of what's the main subject of the picture. Uh, you can think of it as being learning a very generic model of background, but it's more than that because you can also use kind of the composition of the image um, to figure out what's the main subject. Um, uh, and this is also an active area of research by itself. And it assumes basically that the picture had a purpose of, of showing one object of interest or um, no, a scene of interest. And this is also very useful for this task. As you can see in this example, even without any intervention, you can tell uh, the overall extent of the person on the motorbike. Um, and also you can detect which image have a kind of a silent composition. So this is a strong cue. Um, the other one is motion. If you know that your object is always moving, then you can use optical flow to estimate the contours. This is, has been explored for object detection. It's also explored for pixel labeling. And um, yet another one that is a bit more obscure. Pure paper explored it, but it, it, we know that objects occur with some frequency in the world. And if, if your model is amenable for that, you can inject that into your optimization problem. Um, to, to exploit that, to so have a prior on distribution. So here we have uh, cats on top of cars, um, but we know there's only so many cats that go onto the car, so we know the ratio between them. Um, the core assumption that is leveraged also in all of these works is this aspect of similarity across images. And um, in this example for cats, uh, although they are not identical, so you can see a, a trend, but then you are confronted with chairs, where it's hard to find even two chairs that look alike. These are just, uh, you type cats in a forest or chairs in, in, uh, in Google image search, and that's what you get. Um, so this is definitely challenging when the assumption is not true. And again, this is related to the number of samples. If you had all chair ever seen in, in of mankind, every single chair would have a, a group of nearest neighbors that would be quite look-alike. But when you are in finite sample, basically the, the relation between number of samples and a diversity in appearance of your class makes challenging to find uh, similarities across images, and then learning this problem becomes uh, no, much harder, if not impossible. So this is have the core assumptions here there. And uh, one aspect that Jasper will cover in more detail is also um, that you can explore the similarities with other data sets and trying to do transfer across domains. Um, um, and this also has been explored no, as early as six years ago <laughs> and is uh, heavily used in the uh, neural network era. 
So the priors are all these things you know about the world that you want to leverage that then end up being encoded into your learning algorithm. It might be as a regularization term, it might be a, something that guides the hyperparameters you're using, it might be something that we, you will inject indirectly in the strategy in which you're learning, in which you will first pre-train with some assumption and then fine-tune for the real case. So when you're looking into a paper on this area, be always on the look for which are the priors that are being used, explicitly and implicitly, because those are the ones that will break down when you want to use it in your application domain. So let's talk a bit about the hints. We'll go quicker over that. Um, so as we've seen, this also leads here to explore a lot of different ways. You can provide a hint of uh, you know, what's the subject of interest, what's the extent of the subject of interest. So the most vanilla one, on which we'll talk uh, a bit later, is uh, having an image level label. So you're saying there's a person, there's a cat, there's a door, uh, just knowing that this image contains that and other image doesn't contain that creates information about it, about you know, what's the appearance of this object. Um, a bit more bold that has been explored is that you don't necessarily need to have the label. You can have just a caption, a description of the scene, and you can know that Katie is actually a person most of the time, holds a cat, a subject next to the door, another subject, and you can leverage that. So this work has been done on grounding from text to boxes. If you have the boxes, you can then go from boxes to segments. Um, uh, vi video labels is the way to exploit the motion information prior, right? So if you assume your object moves, then having a particular flow uh, on videos is a strong cue. Um, okay, this is what's key. Um, another uh, interesting one is uh, transferring across classes, right? This also has been explored that sometimes you want to transfer across uh, domains like images, you know, indoor, outdoor. But actually, sometimes you can get away with something a bit more bold, where you say, well, you know, bears are basically dogs, right? So if you have available data for dogs, I would transfer to things that I expect a query to be visually similar. Um, and this works quite well, actually. It's um, another dimension of, of knowledge transfer, where you, you basically guide yourself on things that are expected to be similar across classes. So don't be so strict on what you want to transfer from. Be bold. Um, so another classic one, which is, I guess, Probably one of the most intuitive ones is just have give me one click inside the object. And then again, you might be biased that you say, please annotator, be diverse on where you click, or please try to aim at the center. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the work from uh, Papadopoulos, uh, together with Jasper, was a co author, pointed out something is that for me was not quite intuitive, but it's, it's a nice trick to, uh, to have in your, in your bag, which is if you ask two different annotators to click at the center of an object, there's some noise in that. In, in that um, in that click, right? So if you have only one click, well, you can kind of guess which could be the center of the boxes with, uh, with you. But if you have two clicks from two different persons, it turns out that the difference in the center of that click is related to how big is the object. If the object is very big, then it will be more loose in what they click at the center. If the object is very small, then no, they have to target well. And it's, you see this like a you know, somewhat strong relation in the curve, which means that when you have two clicks from two different persons, you not only get to know what's inside the object, what's wrong with the center, you can also have a, a sort of constraint on what's the extent of the object. So you can find information in places you wouldn't expect to have. So you, you want to be hunting for that. Scribbles is an extended version of clicks where you're just uh, you know, moving around and it provides a stronger cue about the extent of the object. It can be inside the object, it could also be outside the object, eliminating the backgrounds. Uh, a weirder one, but the literature on that is actually eye gaze. Sometimes you just want to have natural data if you have uh, tablet is capable of following your eyes, um, then actually this particular work, uh, which is going to present at this conference, shows that you can have someone describing the scene or describing a specific object in the scene, and looking at it, this information is fused, and this allows you to guess which box is. Once you know which box is, then you can use it as box supervision for fixing the game. So there's really a lot of different sorts of information that can be exploited that you want to um, uh, leverage. And then we get to the classic one, on which I will also hopefully get to talk a bit more. Uh, the bonding boxes, right? So if you already have a data set for detection, you can uh, kind of twist it and use it for pixel labeling or instance segmentation. Um, an advanced version of it, uh, which was proposed uh, last year, uh, also though uh, Jasper was involved in that, is actually, you can also provide a bonding box, instead of trying to kind of drag and drop the box, you can just click on the extreme points. Um, and then this still provides a bonding box, it's actually faster to annotate, but also provides a queue of which pixels do belong to the boundary of the object because that's a cue of the boundary of the object, is a strong cue to get the extent of it. So overall, there's a lot of different hints that can be used, uh, some of them more informative than others, and these ones will be used basically as anchors when you're doing your optimization model. So this literature, I will use uh, you know, fixed, 
fix um, the scriptors and then do convex optimizations. The secure tool will just plug everything into a bigger cognet. Um, but basically, this is formula of take some priors that you believe to be true, take some hints that you like, find an application domain, but uh, you have a weekly supervised paper. So for the younger, for the younger ones in the audience, uh, you're going to check a poster, you ask, and just ask now, which are the priors that have been used? Which are the explicit and implicit priors that are there? And which information source is used? And what, why was not that used before? What was the new insight that is being explored? These are kind of the key values you get in your paper. All right, so let's dig into some concrete examples. So let's first talk about going from image level labels to pixel level labels. There's basically two philosophies um, that you will find in the literature around that. There's what I call the gray box approach and uh, the white box approach. So the gray box approach says we have trained a classifier, um, and then we're going to do something over it to try to figure out what the extent of the object there. And the most vanilla version of this is to try to get the gradient um, of the image respect to the scores of the, of the classes of interest of the label. Right? So if I change a bit this image, how does it affect the score? And you get things like that, which was quite a discovery at the time in 2014, and it gives surprisingly good results. Uh, however, upon inspection, you realize that, well, if my classifier is really good, then it should be invariant to small changes in the, in the image. If I do a small perturbation in the color of my shirt, it's still a shirt. So this, the better the classifier, the worse this technique would work. So in a sense, that, that would be an issue, right? So it, it's, if you think about this, some flaws in the approach, it's, it works, but it's meant not to work in the limit. Um, there is a lot of variance around this idea. Uh, one that I find uh, like a good compromise between complexity and benefits, just add noise to the image, do the process 50 times, um, and then average the results. It will look nice, but if you look, inspect in detail, there will be a few quantitative results on these kind of papers. And as I said, doing more samples won't fix the, the, the principal issues you have with these kind of approaches. So something else needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, a classifier was not built nor trained to segment the object. We were just trained to classify the image and will have hatched on the key discriminative aspects and nothing more. So let's see what we can do to fix that. Um, so one of the kind of key papers in this area, which has been reused again and again, uh, is this work from Zhu et al. in 2016, where they do take a classifier, but they modify it. So a typical classifier will have n layers going from the image to uh, higher level abstractions. And then you have a fully connected layer to get the output classes. Um, so what they propose to do is to change that, and instead of having um, instead of having a fully connected layer, you're adding uh, yet one more convolutional layer, and then you put on top of that uh, a global spatial averaging. You just average the whole um, the whole feature map, uh, and that will be your final score for the specification. Uh, so here you have basically as many um, as many layers as the classes you're interested in. And then a small variant of that is that you can switch this uh, global average pooling one layer before, and then at the very end you have this one by one convolution, which is like a linear combination of these feature maps. So it's, it's a relatively small change, but it has, which has profound implications. Because now your model is forced to build um, a response map that is related to the category of interest. And it basically, because it's a, uh, the final score is a linear uh, combination of these, then these are basically capturing different parts of the object that when you combine together, explain uh, a specific class. In this case, apparently, Australian Terrier, which is uh, hopefully the dog that appears here. So you have modified your architecture, or you put your hands in, so it's being trained to do what you want. That's great. Um, so you can see also, because it's per class, you can even ask what you believe is the support for a different class. So this would be the given the image, the support for palace, the support for dome, and so on and so on. And so that gives also insights of how the model behaves, and it also doesn't degrade particularly the classification accuracy. So it's like win win. Um, and compared to the first method that are based gradients and all these variants, it, it's trained for the task, so it's, it works better. Um, however, there are some issues with this. So as you can notice, it's not very sharp. It's not really delineating the object to the level we want to have for pixel level labeling. Uh, in that sense, this queue is almost always used to have one point, the max point, to be believed to be inside the object, but not to really delineate. But this could be fixed. Um, so one of the reasons it's so inaccurate is that actually it's, uh, it's shrinking down in resolution up to 14 by 14 pixels. There's only so much you can do with that resolution. However, if you modify the architecture to have more pixels, then the training goes wrong and you don't get exactly what you want. One of these things that happen with media networks. Um, so another idea that was explored to fix uh, the uh, accuracy of the model, uh, it's also a very influential work uh, done well last year, but still a, a bunch of papers have followed up on this idea. Um, from Kolesnikov and Lampert, where basically they expand the architecture to do three different things. 
So you will do um, um, this, this trick with the multiple layers, which is the gap trick or the cam trick, it has two names, global average, global average pooling uh, layers. And then you take the max responses and you consider these to be seeds. And these are locked in. And when you train, you want to make sure that the seeds do belong um, to, to the object of interest. A uh, second thing you can do is that you can uh, retrain your conversion network to do pixel level labeling, take the outputs, and then straight on take this noisy output of your neural network and run it through a CRF that will look at the image of the image gradients and trying to refine it. And now this refine mask, you're going to use it as um, a supervision for uh, the segmentation. So with this loop here, you're basically saying, please neural network, do learn to output sharp outputs as sharp as a CRF could improve so that at the end of the training, normally, the CRF would do no modification. It would be a no-op because these two things would be identical. Um, so having global, aver global average pooling to have uh, the right classes, having seeds to be in the right locations uh, to guide the seeds, and having the CRF allows the neural network to be on the right places and with the right shape better than before. Um, so this is trying to kind of force post hoc uh, to add refinements into the network. Um, another trick you can use is to use saliency. Saliency is also one of the skills I mentioned before, which would be uh, closer to the object of interest. And this also has shown to work better because not only allows to refine, but also provide an extra queue, an extra prior that you have. So you can also do something different, which is to try to be more focused on the area you care about, not just on uh, the main discriminative aspect. And for this, um, some of the papers use a technique that I call the peekaboo technique. And the way this works is that you're going to hide some of the errors of the image. You just play pick a boo with the new network. You say, here's a dog, but I hide this part. Here's a dog, but I hide that part. And this forces your network to learn to classify and recognize a dog, even if it doesn't see the most discriminating part, which has been included. Right? You only see the legs or the tail or the ears. And then this forces the network to learn that. So it's forced to then have a better coverage of the object, because that has been trained to be discriminative. And this is indeed the case. If you look at what you get after the vanilla gap technique, versus when you do uh, hiding different areas, then the special extent is much, much better. So you can modify the training to get the goals you want to have. A more advanced version of this says, we don't only want to hide randomly, we could even hide adversar adversarially. So we look at the output of the network in the current stage, um, and then we hide it. We force to say, well, now you already got that, you know, the face of that object is community, we're going to erase that from the image uh, by literally graying it out. And now we're going to retrain a network, which is forced to, this, to detect dogs by anything else but the face. And then you erase that and you repeat this process um, up to when the classifier quality drops and then you stop. Um, so this um, looks a bit like this. Basically, if you look at these are going down iterations of this process. So the first model you know, grabs the head, which is the most primitive part of uh, most of mammals. Then the second process just kind of grab the upper part of the head and start to look a bit more on the body. And the third part is really looking at the body because it's forced to be doing that. And so uh, intuitively, this makes sense. Uh, qualitatively, it seems to be capturing the different parts of the object. And quantitatively, indeed, it helps uh, on the class, um, on the task at hand. So one use this kind of mask as a seed for um, this architectural use CRF and the seeds and um, the global average pooling training, then you do get better results. Um, so as, as we can see, if you're interested on going from image level levels to pixel levels, basically there's quite a bit of literature on changing the architecture to get better results, and that's been shown to be quite effective. Um, so you will have to do more than just hope from the classifier, put your hands in, modify it, uh, so that it gets what you want to have. And it's still a question mark of how far we can go. Results are better than before, but not yet pixel perfect. Um, so this is an area of active research. All right, let's move on to a different idea how to go from image level levels to pixel level levels. So um, there's quite a bit of literature on web supervised learning. So this is an instance where you're actually using this prior that there's other, other images that must be somewhat similar to the ones I'm interested on, and they turn out to be on the web. And we know that the web has uh, its own biases, which are different from you know, the typical image you would take from a cell phone. Typically, there are uh, more prototypical objects, the backgrounds are simplified, and sometimes you have images on, uh, on a domain that is not the one of interest that you can choose. So this post the challenges on its own. Um, so uh, among all the papers I'm familiar with, there's actually a paper presented here at CPR, so I invite you to check also the poster for this one, which caught my attention and thought it was worth mentioning. I think it's a good summary of uh, you know, interesting and good ideas on web supervision. 
So you have a target domain you care, let's say Pascal UC, and you have the internet, which you can query uh, with some search engines for images. And then you get a lot of images, let's say, for airplanes, and many of them will be wrong, won't be the airplanes you care about, would be military airplanes, it's not what you're looking for. But what you can do is that you first find a classifier on, let's say, Pascal VOC airplanes, and then you apply this classifier over the web image to bots, and then you just reject anything that the classifier doesn't recognize an airplane. That way you ensure that the domain of the airplanes you get at the end are closer to the one you care about. Right. And then you can apply the technique I described before, where given image level labels, you're going to get a pixel level labeler. Um, exactly in the way I described, and the beauty of it is that because the images from the web tend to have an easy background, then the model can learn to segment those images better um, than the more challenging uh, Pascal VOC dataset, which has all kinds of backgrounds. So these are examples of what you get uh, in this paper, where, sure, these images have easy backgrounds, so the CREF, together with the network, together with the other fast images that look like this, will allow to delineate much better than other works uh, the object of interest. So now you have this web-trained model, and you go back. To your area, of, to, the, to your data set of interest, your target domain, and you apply this model over those images. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so, you have it available to run it over, over your image of interest. You run uh, one uh, image level label to pixel level labels uh, model just from the target domain, just from Pascal VOC. You run your web model over the same images, and now you have basically two set of labels. You have the labels you got from your web model. And you have the set of labels you got from your old technique, what you had before as your baseline, basically. And then the paper proposed um, uh, basically a set of heuristics on how to merge based on the observation of the kind of mistakes these models would do. Basically, the web model would be very accurate, uh, but tends to make uh, errors on the classes, while uh, the target domain model would be good at the classes, but very blobby. So they merge these two together, they train a new model, they get better results, it's great. And this is the first paper I've seen that actually claims to reach uh, a, a, a a quality that is very, very close to uh, the fully supervised models. So it's not the best model known, but it's, it's a baseline that's been used in the literature for good supervision. And basically now we get uh, no, um, interestingly close to, uh, to full supervision just from using the techniques uh, developed from image levelables to pixels and using the web data as extra data. So this is really interesting uh, progress. All right, so now that we have seen how to go from image available to pixels, let's talk about what if you have a bunch of, uh, of boxes already available. You already annotated your data set for detection, now you want to use it to do more with it. Um, so, yeah. so we go from boxes, uh, in, in this case we'll go uh, to instance level uh, pixels. So, all right, let's start with a baseline actually. Um, so I will talk about the baseline method and then a more sophisticated method that is market right now. So what we actually want is to have these you know, beautiful per pixel um, labels of the different categories of interest. But if you have bonding box annotations, what you have is just you no know, bonding boxes, right? This is uh, a very rough approximation of our goal, but it's a starting point. And a simple observation is to notice that we know that the components are surprisingly robust to noise, right? They tend to average out what's uh, very different in appearance and grab what's actually consistent in the images. So our idea was to say, uh, what if we just take these rectangles and put it in as supervision for uh, semantic labeling? Um, so after one iteration, it tends to it tends to um, uh, remove actually uh, it, it doesn't manage to learn the task. Right, the perfect model will have learned to output rectangles, but the model has limited capacity. So basically, it average uh, it average out uh, it average out what is inconsistent and keep what's consistent and appearance with respect to the output labels. And you can see it's already getting much better than the boxes. And then we say, well, what if you use this now to do a second round of training using this output as a supervision for the next model? And it gets a bit better, and a bit better. And no, that looks quite good. So let's see how it looks quite, quite uh, consecutively. So if you just trade a vanilla a pixel labeling network of your choice, the one you like the most, and you train it with boxes, and you keep iterating on this process, then this keeps improving and eventually separates. And the first shot we had at this got uh, tentatively close to the best previous work on this, on this area. So we thought, well, that seems interesting. What if we do something a bit smarter? Like, we know that the box doesn't cover well the full object, but with some chance the center of the object is probably uh, really spot on. Right? So now we're using a prior on the shape respect of our object, which basically we're expecting to be mostly potato shaped. Um, and this way we say to the network, um, these uh, yellowish areas are, are unknown, so just ignore them in this provision. 
the central area no are for sure and the external area are for sure. And when you do that, uh, applying this iterative process, you right away improve over the previous work uh, in this area. So yay. So do take into account the simplest methods sometimes can work surprisingly well. You have to run the baselines. And if we do something a bit smarter that just do boxes, but we actually run something like graph cuts or saliency or any other techniques I mentioned before, um, then this gets quite a bit better. Right? So in our case, we did uh, an, you know, basically graph cut plus plus. And uh, when you do graph cut plus plus, even the first iteration is already quite a bit better than has been achieved before. Um, so this is not to say this is the best method ever. It's just to say uh, that you want to check the baselines. Right? And qualitatively, it looks quite good compared to that particular model trying with the full supervision. And it's in the 95 percent range, and at least at the best model available at the time we did this paper. And the beauty of it is that everything was done per box. So once I got these per box segments, then I can also, uh, instead of training a pixel level label, I can train an instance segmenter. And I just use the same data, I use the same process, but I train a different model at the very end. And then I get an instance segmenter, which also is uh, in the 90 plus range of the full supervised output. Um, so it, it's a very simple technique that works quite well. So do check your baselines, do the simplest idea that could ever work, and no, no reviewer ever complains to have one extra baseline in the paper. So it's a win-win. So what about doing a bit, something a bit smarter? So this is uh, an archive paper done by uh, some people at Google, and some of the pictures are actually from the first auto, which are uh, kindly share some of the slides. So here they have one key idea, and it's like an interesting twist. It's something um, that had explored at some point, but this paper really crystallizes the idea well, which is to say, if we had a network that can do per instance segmentation, then you can use the segmentation to get a crop out object and recombine. So you can use, you can do a cut and paste operation in a scene if you have good segments. And that's kind of interesting, right? It's like an extra way of looking what the network should be able to do if you, if it has learned what you want to learn. So can someone spot something off with this image? No? Raise your hand if it's something off. Stronger? Louder? Yes, exactly. Car duplicated, car going in the wrong direction. Great. But it took a while, right? It takes a while to see what's going on here. Um, so this is uh, a scenario where if the network has learned to extract the objects and recompose, then we could basically use a supervision. Does this look like a natural scene or not? That's one way to supervise this task. So let's look a bit in, no, in the bigger diagram. So we have an object of interest. Um, for which we do have a bonding box, right? And we want to learn to predict a mask out of this particular object, right? So we're still supervising the boxes. We want to learn the mask for this one instance. Um, and the extra operation this paper proposed to do is that once you have extracted that mask, you're going to look at some background image from basically another image from the data set or the same image, and then you try to recompose. And you're going to do a copy-paste operation. You just track the object based on the segment, and then you compose a new object in the scene, just like the one I showed before. And now you have a fake image that has been recomposed. But of course, at the beginning, the network hasn't learned very well the task. So actually, the mask is wrong, and then the fake image is a bit off. But then this is the good news, because now you can use a, uh, a discriminator that is, um, has been trained for the task of taking apart no, the generated images from the actual real object bonding boxes and try to tell them apart. So you are in a GAN setup, where you're generating uh, uh, copy-paste, basically, and you're trying to uh, discriminate what's real and what's fake. And then this point here is a sort of supervision that you can back up into the whole process so that you can train how to predict masks. So if things go well, eventually, you get your full mask. Um, so this is how the big architecture looks like. It's basically what I described. They, they throw a, a mask scene and like architecture in the middle, and then they have a full-fledged, uh, no, one single big linear network that does the training. And this is a GAN network, so as most of us know, at least practitioners know, it's finicky to get going. You have to be careful in how you do the crops, how you do the resizing, how you combine, which kind of regularity you use, which kind of loss, if it's edge loss or um, um, cross entropy loss. But once you've got all those details tuned, uh, tuned in, then the GAN does learn, and you do get a mask out of it. And it looks amazing. It really, at least I'm about back when I saw uh, this, this paper out there. So this is uh, the original bonding box from which the network needs to extract a mask, and then it will use it to recombine it in a different background. So if you look carefully, you can see that the background is changing between these images, but now what the network has been trying is to make sure that, well, within the limits of what you can see in the protector, 
So make sure that the second row looks basically realistic, that you cannot see flaws or, or tails that would tell you that these images in the middle are actually synthetic, they have been recomposed. Um, and then when this works well, then you get masks like this. And now we go back to this problem of concurrence, because, well, most cars in a sunny day have a shadow. You cannot tell apart the shadow from the car because the model has no prior about the shape of a car or the functionality of a car. So yes, the mask does learn to strike out um, the shadow because when you put back the shadow in the other image, it looks still realistic. So this this interesting limitation to the approach, but still it works surprisingly well. And this is how it looks when you color mask things, which always looks nicer. Uh, this is on the Cityscape datasets where they get state of their results. Uh, and this is on Coco datasets where also they get state of their results, but pretty close to other works. So pretty close to baselines. So I think I'm, I'm getting towards the end of my talk. So the main takeaways are um, that many priors have been explored. There's different uh, assumptions you can make. Some of them you make them unwittingly, and then things work. Some of them you make them explicitly, and then you're exploiting uh, what you know about your domain. And a lot of different hints have been explored. Hopefully you got some inspiration out of the things we discussed. For each one of them, there's a paper being cited um, on the slides that we'll be sharing lately. Um, so do explore all the priors you have, because that's what will make your system work on the domain you have. The less prior you have, the more chances this will go wrong. And this is also related to the specific distribution of the data you have. Right? It's different to have only cats in the forest and cats on all kind of places. Um, so which kind of priors you need depends on the distribution of your data. It is also something that most papers don't address carefully, which is the technique works because the distribution of data is of this particular kind. And you want to ask the authors how much work they did in collecting the right data sets so that which supervision works well. It's inter interlinked which priors you need given the hints that you have. Remember this figure about the intersections. And you definitely want to explore new information sources. These are the ones that have been explored. I'm sure there's plenty of others that we haven't thought of through um, that would be nice to have. Um, so as Jasper will, will hammer down one more time uh, in the next talk, do not underestimate the power of transfer learning. Many of these techniques are explicitly and implicitly transferring knowledge from somewhere else. Saliency that has been learned on some data sets is applied on my target domain. Boundary detection that has been learned on some domain is applied here. Uh, web supervision is also very explicitly a form of, of transfer learning. Um, when I pre-train on ImageNet, my model is also a form of transfer learning. So a lot of the millage you see in the 2018 papers on this domain are actually using all of these either implicitly or explicitly. So definitely um, think about using it. Um, and interestingly, I would say that the current techniques are getting close to be useful, right? They're, they're getting really in, in, a, uh, uh, in an area where one wonders about how much one should annotate. Should I really spend all my time annotating on my data because I get this so well? So Jasper also will talk about, well, what can you do with the best support force in which you get good supervision, but also a human in the loop to further improve results. Um, and also, you, Many of these results do get better because they get on the way of better network detection. The better you classifier with this adversarial training for the mask, then you get better delineations. The better segmentary is, then the better you can guess the overall shape of your object. So the quality, even if you do nothing in good supervision by using better networks, the results do get better. So that's good news. Um, and that's what I have to share for now. So are there some questions before we switch to the next presenter? Yeah. Okay, so the question is asking about the, the balance between uh, time versus quality you get between full supervision and just put force, put force on taking data versus weak supervision. Um, so it depends which time you're looking at. There's, I would say there's three different times. There's the machine time, there's the human annotator time, and there's the human engineer time. And these are no different, right? So uh, definitely to get weak supervised techniques going, it, it requires more engineering, right? Uh, but uh, but on, once it works, it will scale up better. Um, so uh, weekly supervision will get, I mean, depending on the specific thing you have, you can basically go to up to zero extra notation to get the segments you wanted to have, right? So, and um, as you pointed out yourself, right, and as we repeated in the slides, uh, bonding boxes are much cheaper to do than, than segments. So 
if you're going to uh, to go a large scale, I think it's, it's a win overall. So if you want to cover many categories, minimal examples, it's, you will end up, there will be this crossing point where it's what worth to put the engineering efforts to then reduce the annotation efforts, you can go quicker. Uh, if you have a small scale data set, yes, if, the, if you're a practitioner and you have a small scale data set, it's definitely worth thinking, maybe just put force in the problem, we'll do the trick. Um, so it's, it's something that you you want to think about. Uh, if your goal is to make a paper, do just provide this, it's more sophisticated. If your goal is to get the data you need to train your model, then check the scale you're operating at. Um, getting an annotation operation going from zero is always a lot of effort. So anyways, it would be engineering evolved, but uh, weak supervision is like a, a different format for that. Yes? No, no, I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying that a, a simple baseline gets surprisingly close to fully supervision. So uh, I'm just saying that when you want to work on, on weekly supervision and you want to explore your new priors, your new idea, make sure you have covered the simplest thing you could do, which is to train the network with noise, uh, which will be at least the this you know, green curve there. Right? So just trade on tra uh, training with it. And uh, in this particular paper, for which I was a co-author, we can show that actually if you do a little bit more than just throw the, the rectangles in, you already get quite a bit of gain, right? So uh, this technique at the end, computationally, is quite cheap. The first situation already gives good results, and it's much simpler than what was been described before as like having a lot of proposals and multiple iterations and a lot of, of, of detail engineering. So I'm just saying that your ground zero should be something uh, simple, and then from there on, you want to see what you can add to get better results. But this is still worse than fully supervised, right? And, and this was done you know, in the snapshot of Sun 17. We know uh, computer vision moving very fast, so if you have a stronger network, uh, it's unclear how this gap looks like. Right? So you know you will get to 65 at least, but if the stronger network is the more 80 fully supervised, it's unclear how the close how that gap is. No, that, those experiments have not been run. Uh, what I can put my hand on fire is that you will get at least 65 million U from the boxes. No, cannot. Easy. And then from there on, it's is to be explored. Yes. Uh, as far as I understand, this network is already producing the this segmentation mask, and uh, does it make sense to produce training data and after that to train like maskers and then based on that data? Does it still perform better than this network or not? Um, so this is this what we basically did here. So this was pre maskers and uh, existing, uh, but we basically do this um, thing with deep mask network, which is a network we try to do instant segmentation. So yes, you can definitely do that. Uh, then if it's going to get better or not, so you, you Every time you retrain, you get some, some level of, of noise removal. Um, um, it will depend on the specific architecture. Masker signal itself tends to have a relatively low resolution mask output, so it, it tends to be a bit blobby unless you do kind of dense here afterwards. So it, it's not obvious to me they will get better. Uh, at least up to the experiment we have, no, the quality has to be Thank you. And to get more, that's where you want to enter into a human in the loop that we just will talk about. Okay, let's take two more questions and then we'll move on. Yes. Hi. Um, that, another question about the bounding box work. Mm -hmm. um, before. Um, so the, the previous slide that you were talking about. Um, exactly. So if in one of those training iterations you learn a set of parameters that predicts a mask, mm -hmm. and then you relabel your training set with that mask, mm -hmm. and then the next iteration you try to predict it again. Yes. Like why would the network learn something new because yes. technically it's already there right? exactly so this is the quantum intuition that's this is why this shouldn't work this is a dumb idea that we don't shouldn't try ah. yet we dared um but so the, the reason why this works is because the network is bad at learning it's, it's, it's really is it's leveraging the fact that the network is not perfect at learning if it was the first situation will output rectangles so it's it's one of these there's an implicit parameter on the complexity of the network that allows this to work and it's robust. Uh, we, we have played with different networks, and they, not in the paper, but play ourselves. It, it works. But it, there would be a moment, maybe in one year, maybe in two years, will be this uh, 10,000 uh, layers in your network that will learn to output the, the box right away. 
So what's fair in leverage is that the network has limited capacity and it has to give away something. And what it's going to give away is the part of the data of the training that was most inconsistent. So sometimes they told me that this eye of a cat, uh, sometimes was a cat, sometimes was a dog, sometimes was a, 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 a horse. So I don't know what it is, so I'm going to remove it. And the pointy ears were always a cat, so that's what it captures. So, so it, do you yeah. reinitialize the network parameters every time you train? Yes, sometimes. we do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. And the last question. Yes. That's also a reason why you don't want to do this. This is why this shouldn't have worked, but it did work. Um, so yes, on principle, the, the, there would be a conceptual risk of drift, right? If you had captured something else, like let's say the corners of the boxes, then it would just emphasize the corner of the boxes in every iteration. The reason why this works is, is, is the reason why new networks are robust to, to training in general, in this aspect of averaging out. Like a simplified meta model of what a new network is doing, it's just averaging patterns between the input and the output. And the patterns that repeat the most are the ones that indeed are kind of causal, right? What's, what, what texture of the input does make this output appear? And that is consistent across the images, right? So you keep repeating uh, this process, and then the, the noise that was there is less and less every time. And then it can focus more and more on the real shape of the object. That's the intuition I have out of this. Um, there will be another time to do questions afterwards, when we do in the closing remark. And we'll be here in the conference and afterwards to do a lot more questions. Thanks for your attention. And now yes, we'll talk about all these knowledge transfer and um, human loop to get even better results. All right, uh, thanks for coming. So what I really want to do in the final part of the presentation is talk about knowledge transfer and new machine collaboration and give a little bit of a flavor of overview of what kind of uh, work is uh, being done in this space. So let's recap. So in the fully supervised learning scenario, we want to, uh, we have annotation of the same degree of output as the test images, as said before. So in the case of detection, we have bounding boxes, and in the case of segmentations, we have uh, pixelized segmentations or um, instances labeled. And in the weekly supervised learning uh, approach, we have annotation to a lower degree than outputs on the test images. But if we look at it, uh, there's actually quite a number of datasets out there with very detailed annotations. So why shouldn't we leverage it? And that's the first part which I want to talk about. It's about knowledge transfer. So the idea is that we have the source training set, which is annotated of the same degree of output as the final uh, uh, test output which you want to have. And then you have a weekly supervised scenario where you have a target set, uh, which is for lower annotation degree. The classes of the target set are disjoint from the targets in the source training set. And then you want to train your either your optical detection model or your segmentation. So let's focus first on the work which is being done uh, in the space of optical detection. So and I will really give a. Uh, 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 play for three different types of works which have been done in this domain. So the first is uh, adaptation of the classifier to the detector. So in 2014, Hoffman and others had a very interesting idea. They said, well, I mean, uh, if we have a classifier of, say, a dog, there must be some relation to the classifier detector. So maybe there's some uh, way to transform the classifier, the image-based classifier, into uh, a bounding box detector by simply transforming the parameters of the classifier. So, uh, and if we know the transformation uh, of the source set, training set between the classifier and the detector, we can leverage this transformation and apply it to uh, uh, the target training set. So where we have image level labels and then we use the transformation to transfer it into a detector. So how does the technique work? So what they did is they took uh, uh, an AlexNet, then uh, it's initialized with classification weights, then they make it into an RCNN uh, detector network where you have images, you provide regions, and you uh, put it through the network. They keep the weights of the classification layer fixed, but they have a um, uh, delta weight, which basically uh, they add the weights of the delta to the classification weights, which gives you new weights, and uh, together that becomes the detector weights. 
So these two things, in principle, is equivalent to what you would use if you just train a detector. But it's like uh, so it's like a residual training, so it's equivalent mathematically. But uh, you train the transformation of what would happen if you transform a classifier into a detector. And so they train it on the source data set, which has bounding boxes. Then afterwards, they uh, uh, use this adaptation layer. They adapt it. Uh, they also apply it to the classification set. Uh, uh, the target train set in order to uh, achieve the detector from this. And then how do they do the adaptation? Well, basically they do a k-nearest neighbor. They look at the, the, the classification weights of the target and the source classes, and they just, uh, let's say, the cat is closest, the target class is, let's say, motorbike, then the closest source is bicycle, and they use the adaptation of the bicycle. They add it to the, the classification ways of the motorcycle to get the detector of the motorcycle. So that's the basic ID. And it works reasonably. Um, although the adaptation layer, well, it, it did not bring super much in, uh, performance. And it was uh, with a follow-up paper they addressed that. So instead of doing a K-nearest neighbor, they um, uh, they had a different way of finding the, the, the adaptation layers, and they did it by uh, using entries of the diffusion matrix and by using the semantic similarity measures such as uh, word attack. I think there is the word attack. Yeah. So that's one way of uh, uh, doing noise transfer. Another way of doing noise transfer in uh, weakly supervised detection is to mix weak and full supervision in a single neural network by leveraging the hierarchy. So this is what uh, the YOLO 9000 paper uh, of last year did. So basically uh, what they did, they had a source and target class in a single image net hierarchy. And uh, the classification, they factorized it by uh, just a hierarchical uh, expansion. So basically the, the chance that you have an apple is the chance that you have an apple gift and that you have fruit times the chance that you have fruit given image of Evelyn entity, times the chance that actually the, the window of interest is no And uh, so then, as I said, they mix full supervision with weak supervision. So uh, for the source class, Apple, it's just standard uh, cosmetic loads. For the target class, Lemon, for which you don't have a bounding box, uh, you do um, a classical weak supervised trick where you just um, basically, for that particular image where you know there's a lemon, you take the one with the highest scored box and you assume that's the ground truth, and then you back propagate based on that. And why this works, why this transfer learning works, is basically if you have an image of a lemon, then it's likely that the boxes uh, in this lemon image score higher on fruit than they would score on vertebrates, because the fruits look more like a compact cluster than the vertebrates do. So uh, the um, so basically the, the, the knowledge of the, the fruits will transfer indirectly to the, the knowledge of the lemon. A third way of doing knowledge transfer of uh, detection is to use a source appearance model. So this was, uh, for example, done in the uh, Green and Ferrari paper in 2012. So again, they leverage uh, the ImageNet uh, classification. And uh, they have several source classes, uh, which are usually ancestor and siblings classes. And basically, what they do for the source classes, they train uh, uh, an appearance model, and a context model, and a localization model. Um, so I'm not going into details, because that's the free no network error. So it's the best model at that time, or the best and fastest, or combination. And what they did is they applied this uh, to a new uh, target image, a target thing. So, for example, if uh, the source class is truck and the target class is um, car, then you train, you apply your um, truck model on the car images and you find the best cars in each of the car images. Then they use these initial car images to train a new appearance model, especially for the car images. Uh, and um, then they did one relocalization step. 
So um, basically, then they, again, they went one iteration uh, where they took the car model and the truck model and applied it both to the car images again and uh, relocalized the cars again. So you can see this is kind of one iteration of multiple instance learning uh, uh, in the transfer learning software. So what they found out in this paper is that actually if you do that, and this actually holds for all the, the weekly supervised techniques, is that you will have, uh, if you look at the overlap of the best, of the, the, the predicted window versus the number of uh, images, you see that for quite a number of uh, examples you have very high overlap windows, those are really big, and you have several windows which have a very low overlap, so those are really bad. So, one thing which you would do uh, uh, is to figure out which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. So this is the self-assessment, which has previously been covered a little bit by uh, Hacker. And uh, this is also uh, a concept which is used in uh, curriculum learning. So you start from the easy images in order to bootstrap the process to continuously go to the more difficult images. So, and by the business observation, they had, uh, the same group had a follow-up paper where they um, managed to get an uh, appearance model which is very low dimensional. And because of that, they uh, managed to train Gaussian processes on it, which is a generative model. And this not only gives, uh, predicts the overlap of the window, but also predicts the confidence uh, which the classifier itself has on this overlap. And based on that, you can do self-assessment and say, well, I only want the windows which are the, the highest score. So this was an interesting approach. And um, it would be interesting to see if something like this can be done in the neural network era where the uh, uh, models are generally not very good in predicting their own problems. So it's a huge area of open research here. So another uh, work in this domain, uh, which uses uh, the uh, transfer and source appearance model, is by uh, Rogan and Wang. So what they do is uh, they uh, again train a, basically an RCN in RCNN the source object classes. Uh, for the target objects, for which there are no bounding boxes, they, uh, they, they apply the objectness. They take the highest good objectness window and train a source model from it. So this is basically um, or you can say a very limited version of the initial uh, 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 initialization of uh, uh, multiple instance learning. And then uh, on the target images, they combine both source and target models to make predictions on the target images. So in this particular example, the, the, the people class is used to make predictions on the, the motorcycle to see where it is. So, um, So in this conference, we have also a work in this space. And uh, while the other were basically, in some sense, limited version of MIL-based approaches, we thought, well, what if we take the best practices of multiple instance learning and then uh, do the uh, revisiting the knowledge transfer in this kind of setting? So just to give a very brief recap again, so in standard multiple instance learning setting, you uh, train your detector where you somehow initialize them. Usually you initialize your bounding box to be on the full image and you train your favorite detector. Then they apply it to the images again. And then the score of the windows in this image, in the target image, is a combination of your appearance model and an object measure which tries to uh, pull the objects towards complete objects and away from parts and away from back. And traditionally, this is a manually edge objectness, such as uh, in Alexa or in uh, the edge boxes of the line models. But in the transfer learning setting, we actually have uh, a lot of source classes. So what we did is we trained a source appearance model. Uh, we do that by first putting all the source classes into a semantic hierarchy. And then we train a multi-box uh, single shot detector, which outputs on a target image bounding boxes. And for every single class in the hierarchy, it predicts a confidence score. Um, uh, and then the question is, how can we transform these scores into knowledge inside the uh, 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 multiple learning framework? So that's what we do. Uh, we have, instead of the objectness, we simply uh, replace the objectness function here 
with a knowledge transfer function. And we, in our work, we uh, experiment with several different ways in knowledge transfer. So we have the class generic knowledge transfer, which is basically objectives, but then properly trained in the source set. We can uh, uh, transfer knowledge from the more intermediate level classes, like vehicles, or we can do very specific. So for target classes, motorcycle, we can transfer from bicycle. So does how does transfer learning work? How well does it work? Well, in our paper, we have some uh, experiments. So this is our multiple instance learning baseline. Uh, this is the performance on the target test set, which is in this case the iOS POC detection data set. So if we do just multiple instance learning uh, and compare it to what we can get with full supervision, we get about 55% of full supervision. If we add our knowledge uh, our transfer function, we go up by 20%, uh, no, go up to 80% with respect to full supervision. So this is a massive jump in accuracy just by adding the knowledge transfer component. And just for full reference, so uh, as Hakan showed earlier, so if you have now the latest uh, weekly supervised of detectors, they get to around 64% uh, of full supervision. So still we're quite a bit above that kind of results. And if you compare this to other works, so uh, here on the left we see the works which tries to transfer a classification model into a detection model. And uh, the the main thing to compare is these two. So this is the best result of those kind of models when we have the LXNet uh, uh, faster RC detector. And we get quite a bit of decent improvement uh, also in the same space with a faster RC detector. And if we change our backbone, then we get uh, obviously quite big uh, extra improvements in uh, mean average position. And here on the right, we also did the experiment uh, compared to the, the YOLO paper, which uh, does uh, mixed supervision. And again, uh, we see that our method uh, achieves twice as good in terms of mean average precision. So the takeaway of this is, is if you do knowledge transfer, it's probably good to leverage on the best practices of weakly supervised uh, learning. So this is knowledge transfer on uh, of detection. Let's move to knowledge transfer on uh, semantic segmentation. So one work which has been done uh, quite early uh, in this space, well, 2012, is um, uh, annotation propagation. So the idea is if, uh, if you have an uh, uh, image data set which you annotate with uh, image level labels and pixel level labels. If you have a very large data set, you can find pixel correspondences between neighboring images. And you can use that to propagate uh, the exact annotations over this graph. Um, that was done in 2012. So afterwards, it was, I don't think there was much more work done in this space, but there has been quite a bit of improvements on current image correspondences. So there are two CPR papers uh, this year. So it would be interesting to see how this approach would now uh, uh, scale to with modern uh, dense image correspondence methods. Uh, another way is uh, done by uh, Kutu et al, which uh, uh, basically they uh, have uh, source knowledge from Pascal. Then they use it to create segmentation image net by combining the source of Pascal and bounding box segmentations in ImageNet uh, to get an initial uh, number of segmentations. And then uh, they propagate this from the images of aircraft without bounding boxes, with bounding boxes to the images without bounding boxes. And then uh, they propagate throughout the hierarchy. And the idea is that they do this in an easy to hard manner, uh, similar to uh, curriculum. A bit more uh, modern works in this space is by uh, Oet O, which is also uh, a where um, uh, you want the, the goal is to just uh, segment uh, an image. Yeah. So you have an input image. There is uh, a component which is trained on a source set, uh, and in this case it's a saliency source set, and this predicts uh, foreground background segmentations. Class agnostic. Uh, there's a seeder, which is basically the, uh, what uh, Rodrigo presented. Uh, this one. 
just now uh, it's a classic equation map, and you use the combination of the, 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 the foreground prediction with the classes seeds to get a reasonable uh, segmentation out of it, reasonable prediction, and you use this as uh, as ground truth for your uh, training your uh, favorite uh, code net which does semantic segmentation. And as they showed, uh, um, so where the previous uh, which my segmentation map had a ratio of full supervision like 74%, and this favorite went up to 81%. So again, quite a bit performance improvement due to adding uh, knowledge from uh, the source data set. There's a very similar uh, paper in uh, HIII 2018. Again, they have a uh, trained class of um, mask from source categories, so class of mask predictor. And as for the same, uh, actually almost the same, they also have this activation map, and again combine it to get a uh, rough output segmentation. Initially, they have some kind of actuarial training to make the, the edges here a bit more smooth and more accurate. And then again, you can train your uh, favorite work in different So those were the works on uh, knowledge transfer for segmentation. There are also some related works which were done earlier, which were not exact in this same setting. So one of them is uh, done in early days where it's in a semi-supervised setting where you have a set of target classes which have some annotations but not fully annotated and there the idea is to use a source uh, training set there. So uh, this would help also basically all the methods which I explained before you can transfer them also to a kind of uh, a mixed weak supervision uh, knowledge transfer setting. And there's also some interesting work on transfer learning by using class attributes. And uh, this work actually allows to recognize previously completely unseen classes. So the conclusions on knowledge transfer. Uh, so one of the thing, uh, challenges of knowledge transfer is to find from which source classes you want to transfer knowledge from. So you can do this using visual information, uh, or you can use semantics information like word effect things. But in general, uh, class agnostic works really well. So actually in our paper, uh, that was the best. Uh, surprisingly, we found out it worked the best. Uh, and I can just show you various ways to do knowledge transfer. Um, and in general, it's probably a good advice to start from the best practices of weak supervised methods, because they have been really tuned for tasks which have been very, which are very low. All right, maybe I'll take one or two questions before I go to the next part. All right, then I'll just go to the next part. So again, uh, we're targeting the problem of weak supervision, where we have generally uh, annotation to a lower degree than the outputs which are on the test images. And I've also shown in the, the very beginning that the, the alternative view of it is that you want to uh, auto-annotate your own training set. So based on the information that you have, you'll try to annotate the, your own training set in the same way as you want the output to be on the test. And if you take this view of auto-annotation, what you can do is you can put uh, a human in the loop to intervene during the process. And intuitively what it enables you to do is that you um, that the machine has some knowledge, and the human corrects the knowledge which the machine has, which hopefully is a very efficient uh, process. So the classic way of doing this is active learning, where uh, you have a set of data, data set with labeled and unlabeled examples, and then based on the classifier, uh, the classifier learns something, and the classifier itself tries to ask, well, I'm not sure over here, so please can you give me a label for this particular example? But for object detection and for semantic segmentation, there's actually quite a little bit of more which you can do than just asking the label for example. Because as we have seen, you can train these kind of detectors from various ways of annotation. And each type of annotation requires a different amount of time for a human uh, to do. So in particular, all weekly supervised segmentation uh, methods, they can be turned in, which operates in clicks or scribbles, can be turned into an interactive counterpart. Because basically, if you have uh, an image and you have a prediction of the machine, 
you can annotate those parts of the image which the machine doesn't know already yet. So one of the canonical works in this uh, space is uh, the work of Rathbeth, where basically you uh, can annotate the, the background, the foreground, then you create a background in the foreground model, uh, you spam a uh, pixelized graph, and you uh, optimize a very efficient energy optimization problem to get the best foreground backgrounds. And uh, basically, if the, the, the computer is inaccurate somewhere, you can just go in with your uh, favorite tool and just add those add annotations on the objects, on the parts where the, the machine is wrong. So in a bit modern, uh, more modern setting, uh, this is uh, currently doing, uh, done using the deep network. Uh, one of the earliest in this space is by uh, Sue et al. Uh, in two years ago, where basically um, there's an input image, there, is, uh, there are clicks of the user. You also need a, a set of source categories to actually be able to train this model. And basically what you do is, um, the, uh, you take just a normal uh, fully supervised convolutional neural net and instead of giving the images input, you also give the clicks as input and they are in this case represented as uh, distance maps to the clicks with uh, one distance map for positive clicks and one distance map for negative clicks. Uh, you can train this neural network on a set of source categories um, and then uh, apply it to a set of target categories and then uh, because it's a clicks, again, you can do this interactively. There's also a work, uh, this CVPR, which uh, has an uh, interesting idea. They said, well, if you click on a particular object, for example, on the doorknob, do you mean the doorknob or do you mean the door? So basically, there's an ambiguity in what you mean with your uh, annotation. And the way they propose to solve this is say, well, we have one network which tries to uh, find, uh, generate a diverse set of proposals. And there's one selection network which tries to select which one of those is best. So another advantage, to the advantage of this would be that normally uh, no network quite put an averaging out uh, confidences, but by having explicit uh, diverse segmentations, uh, if something is multimodal, then uh, you might have better chances in getting with this kind of system. So we'll see uh, tomorrow. Another very interesting uh, line of work is uh, uh, done by Pollock and Aaron. So here the idea is that there's a method which not generates segmentation directly, but generates a uh, polygon outline. And then in the interactive version, you can uh, alter the point, uh, alter any point which the machine generated. So, and uh, tomorrow again, there's uh, uh, some extended version of this. So, anybody interested, please visit the course. But uh, one thing is that different types of annotations require different annotation times. So most likely the click, uh, click here will require different time, human time, than a correction of vertices of the polygon. So this was already realized quite early. So in a very early paper uh, by Jane and Grauman, they actually embraced the, the, the notion that there are different types of annotation that a very different type of uh, cost and uh, you don't always need a very good annotation. So uh, in this particular paper, they consider, uh, consider three types of annotation. So a bounding box, which is a very weak form of annotation. A loose contour, which you can do relatively quickly. Or a polygon, which we know that from Coco it takes about 80 seconds and it's very expensive. And you can see that in, uh, also in different types of images, you need different uh, uh, amounts of supervision. So for the first flower, the box is sufficient. For the second, Cross, you want to stop the contour is good enough, and for the third bird, you really want a tight um, polygon because the, even with a stopping polygon, the predicted thing by the machine is not very good. And so, in this paper, they try uh, to predict, given an image, which form of annotation will have the best trade off between accuracy and human speed. So, does this work? The animation doesn't. Um, so, uh, the, basically, what they have, the, 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 the terms of, in terms of click corrections, 
So in GraphCut, uh, so this is uh, numbers taken from the paper, which is uh, you can see here tomorrow, the new numbers. So uh, if you want to annotate Coco, where every instance, where you want average uh, intersectional green of 85%, with GraphCut you need about 15 clicks. With the XU paper you need about 9 clicks on average, and with their paper you need 8 clicks on average. Unfortunately, there are no human times, because it would be very interesting to see how this compares to the actual uh, annotation process of Coco. One caveat for that is that um, Coco was done on crowdsourcing platforms, and it's well no quite well known for the ones who are in the field, that if you do things on a crowdsourcing platform, it generally takes about factor two or three more time than if you do it yourself with experts in our, or in-house annotators. Um, for the polypon RNN and expected for the polypon RNN++, plus plus, uh, they report in a very small human study that it's about one and a half to 2.7 times faster than drawing polygons using human experiments at a slightly less uh, accurate uh, seconds. So there's also, uh, we can also annotate a single bounding box. So this was done uh, by a PhD student of mine, where uh, we thought, well, instead of annotating the bounding box, which is very expensive, uh, we can also have uh, some uh, weak supervised system generate the bounding box, and again, human can verify it. And that the verification itself takes much less time, so maybe this is a good idea. So in, the first case, in this case, uh, the, the automatically generated bounding box for the cat is quite good, so if you give it to a human, it's like, well, this is a pretty good box. Then in the second case, well, the, the, the weakest device method says, well, this is, uh, I think this is the cat, which is a common failure case of weakest device system that it targets the head of, uh, of uh, an animal or a human, but the second bounding box is good. And basically you can get uh, some kind of uh, verification loops uh, where you can also, in the meantime, sometimes update the detector because you can actually pretty accurate ground truth. So this works uh, pretty well. Now, uh, for this CVPR, we realized something else. So the uh, verification question, the success is actually dependent on uh, the, the image at hand. So if we have here a cat image with these two detections, then, well, the, detection, the image is pretty simple, the detections look quite okay. We know that the cat is generally is a relatively easy class, so maybe it's best to ask a couple of verification questions here, and then we're done. But for this image here, where we want to put the plan, which is almost uh, impossible to see, we have all very, we have a very cluttered image, it's very difficult. We have all those scoring boxes, so maybe here, instead of uh, asking 20 verification questions, we just should draw because that's actually, in the end, that is faster. Um, and based on this intuition, we actually uh, train an agent which takes us input the image and the detections and then decides on an annotation diagram. And we show that this is uh, uh, relatively efficient and that the agents are interesting. So the uh, spotlight is on Thursday afternoon. So the, the final uh, type of work in this space is the multi-type annotation task. So uh, one of the very early work in this space by, again, uh, uh, Grauman and uh, uh, it's called What's Going to Cost You. So here the idea is that there are multiple types of tasks. So one is labeled object in this region, and the other one, so here you give a class label, and another task is completely segment and label this image, which is basically uh, costs much more to do, uh, but it will also give you more information. And the main idea of this paper is that they want to uh, understand uh, how much information gain you will get for a specific type of annotation. So they have this input data set, then they have some automatic methods which try to uh, uh, get, we estimate the, the labels for particular images, and for example in this case, uh, for this image, most regions are understood, but the, the, it's not clear what the label is, so probably then it's good to label the image. Here they say, well, this would be a very informative image. If you give me the label for this, uh, my classifier will really become much stronger. So even if it does take a lot of effort, please label it. And for this image, it's very expensive to annotate, but 
it also doesn't look like there's much information here, so maybe you shouldn't waste human resources on entanglements. So in a quite similar uh, spirit, uh, in a much more involved system with much more uh, different types of annotations, so Rusakovsky and others in CPR 15 wanted to do full image annotation with all bounding boxes and labels in a single image. And there they have, uh, again, they have multiple types of questions. So you can ask a verification question. Is this a bad? Here, are there more pillars? So try to find extra instances of the same object. Is there a fan in the whole image? So basically there are different types of annotation questions to ask. And there's then a machine who takes the, the current beliefs of the, the system. And based on that, tries to uh, find out which task it would send to the human to get the most information gain with the least human effort. So, uh, that was an overview of the flavors of what kind of new machine collaboration uh, methods are there. There are probably many more different ways you can uh, slice the cake. So, in general, the, the core idea of new machine collaboration is really to minimize human annotation time by focusing on the machine does not already know. I emphasize human here because the human annotation time is quite different from what you can get with, for example, to simulate uh, uh, interactions. And, uh, you can, uh, so focusing on the what the machine does not already know, you can do that based on human judgment, by giving the human enough information to decide what, we do, uh, what the machine does not already know. Or you can try to let the machine decide it, uh, what it does not already know, and let the machine ships out the question to the human. So it's kind of self-assessment. Uh, but for this, we would really like to have some generative models. So it would be very interesting to see work in a neural network uh, uh, on this space. And as I just said, there's a quite a large design space of new machine collaboration, and it doesn't seem to be a very crowded area, but it seems to be very promising to getting uh, good annotations from that. And that was it. Thanks for your attention. Right, so uh, we explicitly left it out of the topic, but it definitely it's a very relevant era. So the, um, uh, I mean, the very simplest answer is that, um, so basically if you have annotated data for your target data set, you can use that as training examples, that's a very minimal what you can do. You can also use it to uh, bootstrap the knowledge of your, uh, of your data. So uh, we talked a lot about priors in the weakly supervised uh, system in order to, to find the correct object outlines. And if you have some, even a limited amount of data uh, which is correctly annotated, you can uh, use those as priors uh, to leverage your uh, system. But most, so basically all the weakly supervised system, they can trivially be adjusted to the exactly scenario which you set. But uh, yeah, there's not much work on this space, and I don't see, I've seen any baselines in this space. That's a very interesting open question. I have no idea. <laughs> Hi. Uh, in the context of uh, uh, proposing some bounding boxes and uh, uh, some humans say, okay, it's uh, very quiet, that is okay or not. So how can we quantify this error that we have in the uh, proposing the bounding boxes? Because if you say yes or no, it's not that much uh, useful than if you know that, okay, we are uh, far, uh, I mean, uh, how far we are wrong with this annotation. Right, exactly. So in the in the particular case of that paper, we trained the annotators to say yes when the box is higher overlap than 0 0.5. You can actually train humans for this. At Google, we did the same, but then we trained them to be higher than IOU 0 0.7, which is quite uh, an accurate uh, bounding box. Uh, in terms of 
the final work which we did, where we have the agents uh, uh, doing the whole series. Uh, we did one final experiment where we trained on the original grounds of bounding boxes and on the bounding boxes which came out of the simulations for this verification task. And we found out that uh, the accuracy dropped by 2%. So we get 98% of the accuracy of what you would get by accurately drawing. I mean, it's true. So in general, always uh, uh, that's um, there is a trade-off between the amount of annotation effort you put into something and the amount of accuracy you get. And ideally, papers in this space should have a curve which say, well, look, this is the annotation effort and this is the accuracy which you get. But those experiments are typically quite uh, long to make. So many papers omit them, which is not great, but it's out. I have a question about partial labeling or partial annotation. So, mm -hmm. for example, when you have, uh, say, uh, during the human interaction, and there's uh, five cars in the image, and the like, people only label one bounding box on one car, maybe like the largest one or the most beautiful one, whatever reason, and for that. But had that type of situation, is that possible to adopt that kind of label of annotation to train our, like, detector? Because, like, there are many, like, for example, there are many cars and only, we only label one or two. So whether this is possible to utilize the, the human interaction or even whatever. How to deal with that? I mean, so, um, Well, there are multiple answers to this question. So basically, uh, the, quite often is the case uh, uh, that if there are multiple instances of the same object in an image, they have similar appearance and similar scale. So uh, there are some works which try to transfer from the single instance to the other instances. And I mean, you could imagine that the human could correct this as well. Um, does that answer your question? I, I, I wonder if you have any about which paper or whatever work that dealing with that transforming one, one instance with multiple ones? Yeah, so there's a work by uh, uh, Philo Gaiton and Vittorio Ferrari uh, on this. I can, if you send me an email, I can send you this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a question concerning the bias of the model uh, that proposes the bounding box test or whatever it proposes. How can you how could you deal with the fact that uh, maybe the notator is just confirming what the model already knows how to do, and how can you discover new instances that the model is not proposing, and uh, labels where the model is not good at it? So in, in this case, for the verification series, we just naively uh, give everything to the human. So basically, there the idea is if the the, the machine thinks it's a good bounding box, you want the human to verify. But in general, uh, it's true that if the machine is very confident, it, you actually may not want the machine to do this. And so um, there are two ways to do this. So one is to have self-assessment there. Uh, but I haven't seen yet very convincing ways to do self-assessment in a neural network era. Uh, another way, which is actually what we exploit in some of our submission papers, is where uh, we show a full image segmentation to a human. Um, where the human can correct those things which he found wrong in that particular image. So then, basically by showing multiple uh, 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 things what the machine knows, the human can correct it. The human can decide what it does not. But it's, not, it's generally an open question how to do this most of that. And, and the question is something that we call, if you want to increase uh, uh, wherever the machine doesn't know, or when the machine doesn't say anything. So let's say you ask for the bounding box and stuff. What plan them? Yeah. Just get no answer or very extremely low confidence answer. Right. I mean, then you have to just backtrack to what uh, what you know will give an answer, which is just the full manual annotation in that case. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll keep it uh, quick and short for the for the concluding remarks. So thanks everyone for for coming for joining us. I hope. You got what you wanted to get after this tutorial. We debated a lot about which, which topics to cover and which angles to have, so we try to sparkle a bit of uh, goodness for uh, all different all different audience. So I hope you, uh, this worked out. Um, but feel free to ask us um, uh, to, no, to send feedback if you want about uh, specific topics you want to cover for future talks to do like that. Um, 
this is any burning question is like overarching, right? We had like each one, each one talk had like had a topic, but if there's any question is like overall on the topic, this is the moment for asking. No, speak now. Or... Okay. Perfect. So, um, these are some topics that are repeated on all three talks, and this was on purpose, right? These are the things that I think um, should you know, stay in your mind, and these are only three simple messages, right? Uh, we all know, but still needs to be repeated, right? We are in an era where kind of brute forcing computer vision at this time, and uh, to brute force it, we use a lot of data, and data is expensive, especially if you want to go to a more interesting application domains, beyond just one remoteness. And, and we believe that weekly supervised learning is, is one of the techniques that will help to scale up, both in volume, but also in application domains, right? Like every new application domain of Pascal GSC is not exactly what you want, Kubernetes is not exactly what you want, how you get from there to what you need for your applications. Um, and there's a lot of ideas, it's really a rich, it's, it's a rich domain, it's, uh, it's a lot of work being done there, and I think there's, there's really room for a lot of uh, delight and discovery and new crazy ideas that, that we'll be talking about for the next five years. Um, focusing both on the prior side and on the information sources. And in a sense, you can think of transfer learning, which has been shown uh, multiple times to be quite effective, both you know, like explicitly as, as Jasper talked, but also implicitly when you have objectness or, sil or silencing methods, it's all always in there in the background. It, you can think of it basically as a data-driven way to build your priors, right? It's, it's all around this, the same idea in space. But yeah, do keep in mind to, to exploit it and evaluate it as part of your baseline when you work on this. And that's it. It's a tricky message, and we're looking forward to see your next paper from this area, and hope you have a good time.